Okay, so many weeks ago we were doing read Solomon code. So this was the decoding algorithm, and in the code the encoding was just uh, so you have this big n many bits that Alice wants to send to Bob, and uh, so you break it into blocks of uh, b bits, and there are k many blocks. So b times k is equal to n. And uh, these each block b bit you see as a finite field element, right? A finite field of size two raised to b. So it naturally is a finite field element, and there are k elements. So you get a degree k minus one polynomial. It's a non-monic polynomial, although that thing is not very important. But uh, in degree k minus one, uh, you you need k coefficients. So that so the message gives you that. And uh, that defines a polynomial p x. You send evaluations of this polynomial. Usually in applications, it is assumed that you will send uh, all possible evaluations. Okay, so two raised to b is the finite field size. You will evaluate your polynomial at each field element, and you will send these two raised to b values. So that is small n. Okay, so you send uh, n. Finite field elements, which is basically the polynomial evaluated at all the points, and then arbitrarily this information will get corrupted in the channel, and uh, up to some limit. I mean, if the number of errors is below the threshold, then uh, the decoding algorithm will still be able to recover p, and hence the message. Any questions? So you can set the parameters. From the decoding algorithm, we got uh, error tolerance nearly n by two. Okay, small n is the number of uh, values sent, and if the error is less than n by two, half of them, less than half of them get corrupted. Still, it will work. Okay, which is a very uh, surprising fact, because n by two is the theoretical limit. Okay, and your your algorithm is actually able to correct up nearly up to the theoretical limit. And today we will actually even cross this theoretical limit, and we will be able to correct errors beyond n by two. Okay, which is uh, which is sounds impossible, but it's doable. But anyway, so here we set the parameters, and uh, okay, so begin is the main parameter, which is it's a single parameter setting. Uh, that is the number of values sent on the channel. The key is the uh, number of coefficients. So that is uh, just a little bit smaller. So the stretch here is very small. The stretch is only from n by log n to n. Okay, it's minimal stretch. While the brute force would have required n square. And the field size is also around n. Two raised to b is also around n. Okay. And for that uh, error tolerance, t is this uh, n by two times uh, nearly one. As n tends to infinity, this is nearly one. So this is nearly n by two. So 50 percent error correction in the finite field alphabet. So alphabet here is not zero one, but finite field. So the element uh, we are counting as one uh, extended bit of information. Yeah, we did not go into the details, but all this can be done in nearly linear time in n. Okay, the evaluations and then the uh, decoding, etc., is quite fast. Okay, so with that we'll move forward. So there is one concept, the underlying concept of distance in this code and in general in error correcting codes. So for example, if In the previous uh, slide, this t that was error tolerance of the code, two t plus one is called the distance. So in in our case, we you have only seen exam uh, one example of read Solomon code. Distance of that is two t plus one as t as before. Uh, this is called distance because uh, 
combinatorially if you look at uh, two code words, uh, they are sufficiently far away in the space, which means that even if uh, the code word which was sent on the channel, even if there is a corruption which is within a neighborhood of the code, from that corrupted uh, string, you the, the decoding algorithm will give you the center of the ball, which is the code word and hence the message. Okay, so the balls around code words, they are kind of non-overlapping and their, you can say their radius is t. How do we define? The spheres around the... Right. So it is the minimum Hamming distance between any two distinct code words. So in a picture, if you have a ball around a code word C1 and uh, around a code word C2, so code word is a string of uh, letters where in our case the alphabet is finite field element. So C1 is basically this uh, big and many uh, field elements and C2 is another array of big and many field elements. So in how many locations are they different? Okay, so in this alphabet that is what we are calling Hamming distance. Usually it is for uh, uh, binary strings but the same thing you can generalize to any alphabet. So C1, C2 are basically two arrays equal length and in what is the difference, uh, how many locations are there where the, the arrays are different. Uh, that is called uh, Hamming distance between C1, C2 in this alphabet, in the finite field alphabet and uh, over all the pairs of code words pick the minimum, okay, minimize over all pairs of C1, C2. C1 different from C2 of course. So that is called uh, basically distance of a code. Yes. So is the distance then twice the whatever error you are decoding? Yeah, yeah. So, so whatever is your… Uh, Diameter of this ball plus one. Yeah, whatever is the requirement uh, in practice you want to tolerate let us say uh, t many errors, then it is clear that the distance between these two arrays has to be more than 2t, strictly bigger than 2t. Even if it is 2t, uh, you might be in a situation where t errors happen and then that will be, that will correspond, that corrupted, uh, mess, uh, the corrupted code word will correspond to two balls and then you cannot distinguish uh, how did it arise, what was the message. So the balls really have to be uh, non-overlapping. Right. So, whatever is your desired error tolerance, distance has to be strictly twice as big. So, that is it. So, if you have, uh, now when this uh, code word C1 is sent on the channel, then it this might shift to this position, C1 prime, right. And C2, when sent over a corrupt channel, erroneous channel, it may shift here, C2 prime. So, it might shift here and this might shift here. So C1 may actually shift uh, closer to the ball C2, around C2 and C2 may shift closer to the ball around C1. So they are getting very close and if these two balls were, t t were actually, there was an overlapping point, that point then uh, you will not be able to decode because it will correspond to two code words. But in this case it is okay because uh, the nearest code word to C1 prime is still C1, right. So that is the actually the advantage uh, that Bob has. No matter what the channel does within the threshold of T, T or less, Bob will able to always get to C1 from C1 prime. And this uh, radius is T, of course, of the balls, okay. So up to T errors, uh, these uh, corrupt strings will remain inside the ball. Any questions? So this is the notion of distance of a code word, uh, of a coding scheme in fact, in general. Uh, it is clear that you cannot cross uh, 50 percent, you cannot even achieve 50 percent. So uh, distance delta implies that error tolerance of any code word, of any coding scheme is less than delta by 2, right. So if you have a, a mathematical coding scheme, 
with a proven distance of uh, delta or less then in practice the error tolerance will be less than half it cannot be better than this so distance can be in terms of uh, fractions it can be at most uh, one and so the the error is always tolerance is always less than half okay so what in particular what it means is uh, with the error bound so if there are half or more errors the problem that is happening in decoding is uh, that there are uh, more than one possible code words and hence messages corresponding to what bob got bob received there are uh, many messages corresponding to a corrupted code word so there are two things now uh, so so we basically want to cross this barrier of n by 2 so what if uh, the channel makes corruption more than 50% right so theoretically then it is impossible to find the message but uh, how many messages are possible corresponding to the string that bob received right so if you can count if you can uh, give a upper bound on the count uh, then there will be hope that maybe there is a decoding algorithm that gives a list of messages okay so that is called the list decoding uh, that did not exist before even the concept actually came with the the read uh, the list decoding or of uh, read solomon code which we'll see now okay and uh, so that amazing algorithm will also given upper bound on the number of messages corresponding to the corrupted string that bob got okay so it is both an algorithm and a combinatorial result because otherwise it is not clear how will you count uh the number of code words corresponding to a string um which is heavily corrupted so the corruption is let's say more than uh, 55% so in that case how many uh, messages are possible so the algorithm will not only uh upper bound the number of such messages it will also give them to you in the form of a list so could we find all of them that's the algorithmic question so in particular are the is the list small if the list for example is uh, exponentially long then there is no point finding them uh, which uh, will happen at some point right if the errors are very close to uh, how much yeah so in the extreme case if every bit has been flipped uh, almost everything has been flipped then uh, then obviously you will expect the messages to be 2 raised to n many the list have will be around 2 raised to n but what if that has not happened what if you are still very close to n by 2 somewhere between 50% and 55% so in that case is the list still exponentially large right so those are the questions of as or how, how is the asymptotic growing because below 50% it was just one so intuitively beyond 50% it should be slightly bigger than 1 but not exponential not 2 raised to n so that was achieved by a theoretical computer scientist called madhusudan fairly recently so he found an efficient way to list decode k 
Okay, so even this term was uh, a first. So in particular, list decode read Solomon. So this is what we'll see now. So we'll do list decoding for read Solomon. So okay, the setting is uh, as before. So just to recall. So you had. Uh, Alice had a message d0 to dk minus 1. These are the k field elements. The Reed Solomon coding algorithm gave her uh, n field elements, which is basically the evaluation. So P is the polynomial that this message defines and the evaluation of that at sorry E0. E0 is the kind of the first field element then E1 is the second and so on. So compute all these values and just send it over the channel. The channel will corrupt it. And uh, we'll assume that at least t many are correct, greater than uh, big t many. So greater than t are correct. And the remaining n minus uh, big t maybe are in fact incorrect. They have been corrupted. So what uh, Bob gets is we are calling it C0 prime to C n minus 1 prime. Okay, so out so in this uh, only t positions are correct and obviously Bob has no idea uh, which big t many positions are these. Uh, there is no way to find that <coughs> a priori, right, because the number of positions is uh, uh, n choose t which is exponentially large. And moreover, we will not restrict uh, uh, big T to be half. So the correct ones may be less than n by 2. Right? So, so this is a very difficult problem for Bob. So how will you solve it? How, how will Bob try to find the list of all possible uh, messages d0 to dk minus 1? For some bound on big T, so you fix some bound on big T, let's say just below n by 2. And within that bound, how many messages are possible? Right, that's the question. So the way we decoded before the unique decoding, that was by, so there was this auxiliary polynomial, right, error locator polynomial. So what was that? It collected the wrong positions, right? So it was a univariate polynomial whose uh, roots were supposed to be the wrong positions. So now what uh, what is done is uh, something quite different. So now we'll actually error locator polynomial we'll pick will be bivariate. Okay, so that uh, the idea will be that if the channel was uh, error free then for field element e the value would have been p p of e so the bivariate polynomial will try to interpolate these points okay field element comma p of that element so that is a point in the 2d space and the bivariate polynomial will interpolate that but obviously that is not what is happening in the channel. So the channel will uh, not really correspond to P of E 
for n minus t many uh, places. But anyways, we'll build and see what to deduce. So let us first change the error lo error locator polynomial. So. We are changing the definition. So consider a bivariate error locator Q x comma y of degree dx and dy, uh, these are the individual degrees. So, let me define it. So, dx is the degree of q with respect to x and dy is degree of q with respect to y. Okay, so, we call these individual degrees. So now the error locator polynomial will be very different from what we used before. First of all, it is bivariate and in the definition you won't even see uh, anything to do with errors actually. So we will fix dx and dy later. Let us first develop the setting such that what we want is uh, q of e j comma c j prime, we want it to be 0. Yeah, so this is just a say a curve that passes through all these points that Bob has received. Right? So, Bob has received e j comma c j prime. Uh, so, this is just a kind of the curve that uh, fits whatever Bob received. So, you do not really see uh, what errors is it capturing, right? the, the definition is very different from what you saw before. Okay, so, for what conditions on d, dx and dy will this q exist? That also we have to remember. It will not exist for every dx dy, right? So, intuitively this q will exist only when dx and dy are sufficiently large. If uh, one of these is very small, uh, then this low degree q will not be able to fit all the points. So, exactly the bound you get is this. So, as long as dx, essentially dx times dy, the product of these two is at least n, q will exist. Why is that? So, how many unknowns are there in q? It is this uh, 1 plus dx times uh, 1 plus dy, it is a bivariate polynomial of these respective individual degrees. So, that many unknowns and clearly in those unknowns, this uh, system is a linear system. So, if the as long as the unknowns are more than the constraints, uh, also observe that this is a homogeneous linear system, right? So, there is no question of uh, infeasibility. So, just by numbers, uh, how many unknowns are there? You are guaranteed a solution. So, this uh, essentially dx times dy should be at least n, and then q definitely exists. In fact, many q's may exist. Then uh, such a non-zero q exists. And it can be computed quite easily. By linear algebra. Right, so, it exists and it can be found easily. So, Bob does that. Uh, 
we have still not fixed dx and dy that will because dx dy will will put more constraints and then we'll solve it okay so bob now has computed this q how do you think this q will help do you see that this q hides the message or contains the message or the list of messages in fact all possible uh, messages are somehow contained in this q so let's to see that let us look at the idealized setting when the channel doesn't make a mistake or doesn't corrupt so that would have been so let's say um, you look at this univariate polynomial which is by setting y equal to px right so a correct uh, so a message p of our interest uh, if the channel was correct then it would have given uh, x comma px <coughs> bob would have received x comma px uh, so if you substitute that in q let's call that polynomial r so do you see that uh, this uh, or how can you ensure that the q that bob has found vanishes at y equal to px right this is exactly what you want so this bivariate polynomial q uh, just computed in step 1 what if its factors give you y minus p's for all p's right so that so basically bob will then find q and then factorize it and the factors will give the list of messages or in fact first uh, yeah p is the message so bob will have the list of messages but for that uh, we have to or bob has to make sure that the q that has been computed uh, actually vanishes at y equal to p so this r should be zero right can that be achieved can that be ensured so let us see the degree of this so degree is dx of q plus in y you have substituted p whose degree was k minus 1 right so k minus 1 times dy that is the degree of r so obviously we have to use the fact that uh, at least t many ejs are correct right so r at those ejs is zero so we know uh, that r at uh, at least some of the ejs does vanish for t many j in uh, 0 to n minus 1 right this is the hypothesis we still haven't fixed t we have not fixed dx dy t we'll do that in the end but uh, some guarantee has been provided that t many positions are correct sir why did you say that sorry r of ej is equal to yeah so what is ej comma pej <coughs> pej in for those j's is cj prime and the q that bob has found satisfies that uh, this follows from uh, equation 1 from this equation so from that equation uh, r ej you can see is q q at ej comma pej but pej is the value that bob received so by construction of q this is true 
So for t many values, uh, r is vanishing. But you actually want r to vanish for all the values, for all j. I mean, okay, not, not really. Or you want just r to vanish, right? So what matters is uh, what, how, how, what is the degree of r? So we have to compare uh, uh, this uh, vanishing of r at some ejs with the degree of r. So if the degree of r is less than this, then r vanishes, right? That's the, so the last check that you have to do is compare this number t with the, the degree of r. So, but in the first equation, we have assumed that it vanishes for all those 0 to n minus 1, not just for t. Sorry? In, in first equation, equation, we have assumed that it vanishes for all... G. That is fine. I mean, how is that in contradiction with, the, in conflict with the fact that r e j is equal to 0 for t many j? We are just using part of the construction of q. So... So the point being made here is uh, that as long as uh, t is bigger than the degree, degree is actually smaller than this bound dx plus k minus 1 dy. So as long as t is bigger than dx plus k minus 1 dy, right, which is greater than or equal to degree of r, What can you deduce? That r is 0. And if r is 0, then you would have deduced that y minus p is a factor of q, right? Which is, which is what uh, Bob wants, that the factors of q should contain p because Bob can uh, use enough algebra and come up with a factorization algorithm. You haven't seen how to factor bivariates, you have only seen how to factor univariates. But as promised in this course, you will see factorization algorithms for any number of variables. So Bob can use one of those algorithms, factor Q, and hence find P. And not only one P, but all possible Ps. Moreover, since Q has limited degree, there are few p's, right? So this algebraic root is giving you a very interesting combinatorial fact, right? That the number of such uh, strings that could get corrupted and reach Bob is small. That's the message. That's the p of x, right? That was the settings we had before. P is the polynomial you get from Di's. So P is uh, Di Xi. Okay, it's the original message. You want to find the message P. And since it is not unique, you want to find all of them. Uh, so all, so r r right now we haven't fixed anything. So T is free, DX is free, DY is free. So you just set them appropriately. And for that setting, you have an algorithm. Any questions? Uh, so there are, uh, yeah, so there is this constraint, uh, essentially dx times dy should be at least n and there is the other constraint that uh, dx plus k dy should be less than t. These are opposite constraints. So you have to be just careful to satisfy these opposite constraints. And for that setting of t dx dy, you have a working algorithm, list decoding algorithm. So let us collect that in a lemma. So if n is less than uh, 
the product and the sum is less than t. So, product should be large and sum should be small, right. If that happens, then actually any curve fitting the points that Bob got this has y minus p x as a factor. Okay, so, factorization is the way to go. Okay, Bob will just do linear algebra, uh, use a system uh, linear system solver and then a factorization algorithm and that will give the whole list. Okay, so, this is an it is a first and it is an amazing algorithm. So, yeah, so the list decoding algorithm let us see with uh, some parameters fixed. So, let us fix you can see that you want the product large and the sum small. Uh, so, why not take uh, essentially them to be square root of n around square root right. So, that is why we will fix something close to square root. So, let us fix d x to be square root of n k d y to be square root of n by k and t to be twice square root of n k. Okay, so, square roots appear. You can see that uh, d x times d y is more than n by design and uh, d x plus k d y is uh, smaller than t, smaller than twice square root of n k, right. So, those two constraints are satisfied. So, you can apply the lemma. I mean obviously, the square root may this may not be an integer. So, you will just take uh, floor or ceiling. Simply compute q. Such that uh, q e j c j prime is 0 for all j. And the degree bounds for q individual degree bounds are dx dy, right? That is the setting. And then third is uh, factorize this bivariate, which you don't know how to factorize right now, but assuming some factorization algorithm factorize this and collect its factors of the form y minus p x. So, essentially factors that are uh, individual degree 1 with respect to y and monic. Okay, so, these uh, special factors uh, you collect them. Let me use different f x y minus f x. Is there any property on f? Any uh, property of f that you want to satisfy? How was your message like? 
yeah the so if the if the factor has uh, f with degree more than k minus 1 then it's not a message so there is no point keeping that in in your list in bobs list so these factors with uh, degree of f less than k right so you collect these and this is your list of uh, messages f so how many are they what is the upper bound uh it is linear in y so the yeah dy or dxy is this dy is uh, which is square root of n by k yeah but like you are calculating that by degree of y right yes you can also look at degree of x and that will be dxy k because each factor would have a degree k dxy k is also square root of n by k yeah. ah yeah it's the same but like you it, can also yeah dx it's the minimum of Right, so we can say in the end uh, square root of n by k. That's uh, sure. So uh, number of f's is less than equal to individual degree of y, which is less than equal to square root of n by k. Right, so you get a very precise bound, which is uh, which is incredible. That uh, yeah, so let us interpret this. I don't think you have interpreted the parameters. What do they physically mean? So, if you want to send uh, a message with k field elements by stretching it to n field elements over the channel, where the channel will at least preserve square root of n k many locations or field elements correct. so in that case uh, the number of possible messages corresponding to a corrupted string that bob received number of possible messages is at most square root of n by k so you get a very precise bound for this setting so how many errors are being tolerated so that is just n minus 2 uh, square root of nk so even in the presence of those many errors which is actually quite large uh, if you think of k as uh, much smaller than n in that case n minus square root of nk is uh, nearly close to everything which is n right it's uh, it's not really 55% it's more like 99% for setting of k you can actually make it 99% uh, of the field elements have been corrupted by the channel right only 1% correct information is there but still uh, a list of all the possible messages will be outputted by this algorithm right but then k has to be suitably small so basically what it means smaller k for the same n means that you need uh, slightly more stretch that's all but the stretch that you need is uh, only by a constant factor right so for a constant factor stretch of the message you can go up to 99% errors right this is uh, this seems uh, theoretically impossible okay so you just output these that's the final step so output the list okay f as above that's the list which is output okay uh, any questions about this algorithm so so for n equal to k log square k so basically k is being stretched to k log square k which is not really constant factor why did i say constant factor okay no this i think will achieve more 
So, for this we only need two k log k correct values. Okay, so, k uh, is stretched to k log square k, but amongst these k log square k which were sent over the channel, you only need k log k values to be correct, right? which is actually uh, if you look at the fraction, this is tending to 0. Right? So, you really want uh, you you just need uh, for for this algorithm to work to give a small list uh, the density of correct values is uh, nearly zero it's not even a constant right that's a even more stunning setting is this clear but the stretch here is non constant it's k to k times log square okay Yeah, so what you have in the end is let us collect uh, everything. So, this list decoding algorithm is in randomized polynomial time. Well, we have not shown that completely because uh, of this major uh, missing algorithm to factor q x comma y, uh, but that will be our goal from now. So, in the next uh, many lectures, we will see how to factorize uh, bivariates. Basically, we will reduce bivariates to univariates and then use Cantor's Zasanos. So, everything will be ultimately randomized poly time. And it works up to n minus two square root n k many errors. and uh, the list which it will output is very small square root of uh, n by k. So, definitely smaller than n. Yeah, so, for this uh, these things to work now we have to solve some new problems. right? So, what are the new problems that arise out of this? in computational algebra. So, in decoding R s codes, we require two new algebraic algorithms. So, first is construction of a finite field itself. In particular, it is uh, f 2 raised to b. So, we happily said that the encoding algorithm will pick a field and then do the encoding, uh, but since b is really a variable how will the algorithm find this finite field or construct this uh, explicitly? So, till now you have done many exercises on finite fields. So, you certainly know that they exist uh, and the question boils down to finding a an irreducible polynomial of degree b, but how do you find it? 
in the application of uh, this uh, coding encoding algorithm actually 2 raised to b is not large 2 raised to b is only as big as n uh, so you can also do this by brute force because the number of irreducible polynomials the, the space is only n so you can just try setting all possible values 0 1 but the bigger question is suppose uh, b is given to you in the input so then 2 raised to b is exponentially large in terms of b so you cannot do brute force you cannot go over all the polynomials of degree b basically the space is too big so how do you pinpoint one irreducible out of all polynomials right any ideas in the first assignment there was this question where you constructed uh, or you saw how to construct uh, irreducibles over q so integral irreducibles rational irredu irreducibles that th it, there was an explicit uh, example right but for finite field you never saw an explicit example that you can just pick so this actually is an algorithmic problem you have to for every input you have to do some computations and come up with an irreducible polynomial so that we will see next that's the first problem the second problem that has arisen is is a much bigger problem which is uh, factoring a bivariate polynomial in fact if you think about it given a bivariate polynomial uh, you currently don't have any idea how to check whether it's reducible or irreducible right forget about factorization even a bivariate how do you check its irreducibility right that is that seems to be a very challenging question uh, so we'll solve all those problems at a later point well so what is the easiest thing that comes to your mind to search in this uh, exponential space of polynomials you already know the keyword you can take a polynomial and factor it no no so you pick a random polynomial yeah pick a random polynomial and factor it so that is enough but why is it challenging the irreducible factor won't be necessarily a, like the required degree no 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 even better i'm saying that pick a random polynomial yeah it's already irreducible it's a one line algorithm now if you want to see why it works well that is that is of course hard so that is what we'll do now why should such a thing work so constructing fq in general where q is uh, p raised to b this is given in binary in the input right so in the the input size is b log p so this is simply a number it is just given to you in the input and for this number you have to construct uh, that sized field finite field right that's the input output description uh, you could do it by brute force but then the time you will spend is q and uh, since the input is in given in binary q is exponentially large when b crosses 50 then uh, this number is actually more than 2 raised to 50 and that then becomes uh, very quickly it becomes infeasible to actually go over all degree b polynomials with coefficients 0 to p minus 1 right that is a that is a that is truly an exponential space as b grows basically you want to construct an irreducible polynomial
over fp of degree b. So, this construction of a finite field is completely equivalent to uh, this irreducible polynomial construction. There is no difference in between these two problems. Uh, that you can see by the exercises on finite field. So, finite field will always correspond to an irreducible polynomial. That is the way to represent it. And an irreducible polynomial will immediately give you a finite field. Okay, these two questions are one and the same also computationally. Uh, so, what we will show is the random choice works. So, random choice uh, will work only if the density of uh, irreducibles is quite high in this space of polynomials, right. So, this is basically counting the number of irreducible polynomials. So, we will basically give you the, we will estimate the number of irreducible polynomials of degree b over fp. So, have you seen this calculation before? This is sometimes done in uh, discrete math course. Uses Mobius function. Yes. So, it yeah for the exact one it does, but I will not need Mobius function. I just want an estimate. So, uh, so I'll approximate everything. Uh, what it will use? The starting point is. Uh, there is this uh, magical polynomial that you have seen before that collects all the irreducible polynomials, right. So, already the irreducible polynomials are collected in one place which is this uh, essentially x to the q minus x. So, this contains uh, degree b irreducible polynomials, but, but also some lower degree ones. Uh, and using the recursive structure there, we will get a recursion which will give, give us an estimate on the number. Okay, so, that uh, Frobenius polynomial is, uh, is the reason why all this works. Again, so let pi L, let pi L be the number of irreducible polynomials in f p x of degree L. Now, recall that x raised to p raised to L minus x has as factors all irreducibles of degree what dividing L right that is what we deduced before in Cantor's Asanos analysis or somewhere. Uh, so, L, but also the factors of L, all those irreducibles when you multiply them, you exactly get uh, x to the p to the L minus x, right. This is uh, without repetition, they are, they are uniquely dividing, dividing with multiplicity 1. So, all irreducibles of degree, I want a name, k dividing L. So, let us write this as a formula p to the L is equal to what? p to the L is the degree of this polynomial. Uh, it is equal to pi k where k divides L and 
degree k reducible has degree k, right? So, and their number is pi k. So, this is k times pi k, right? So, k times pi k for all k, their sum is equal to the degree of, of this Frobenius polynomial. Is that okay? Okay, so just based on this, we'll we'll get prove a major property that uh, pi l is between. Or let me give it as a density. So density. The density of irreducibles amongst all polynomials of degree L is at most uh, 1 by L and 1 by at least 1 by 2 L. So, this is a brilliant result for many reasons. One is that uh, it actually is an algebraic version of the prime number theorem. Right. So, prime number theorem also says that the density of prime numbers below x is around uh, 1 over log x. And what is log in this? The analog of log here is L. Right. So, here also it is saying that it is 1 by L. So, algebra and number theory are not so different, but algebra is easier. Right. That is that is what you will see. So, this thing has a very short proof. On the other hand, the original prime number theorem has a very involved proof. Yeah, this can be written also in a more precise way. So, but that we do not need for the algorithm. Oh, it's time is up. So, in fact, you can say that pi L is p raised to L by L, that is the main term plus square root of this. Okay, so, this second thing is uh, very precise. It is actually giving you the asymptotic behavior of pi L. The main term is p raise to L by L. The error term is square root of that. So, its error term is significantly smaller than the main term. Uh, now, if you look at the analog of this from for prime numbers, that is still an open question. Okay, whether the prime number theorem, the error term can be made square root, that is an open question for around two centuries. Uh, it is called the Riemann hypothesis. Okay, so in one paragraph, we can prove Riemann hypothesis here, but not in the prime number, actual prime numbers. Yeah, yeah, it's some constant. Yeah, if you look at the best results, uh, even this must be true. Yeah, so this is true for all L. The prime number estimate you need then uh, bigger and bigger x. I remember definitely this. Uh, on the right side a factor of 2 and on the left a factor of half will work in the prime number case. Uh, okay, so, we will start this next time. It is a short proof, it just follows uh, the recursive formula we have written above. Okay, the above can be seen as a, is a, as a relationship between pi L and things smaller than L like L by 2, L by 3. So, it is a recursive formula. If you use that recursive formula carefully, uh, you can prove this theorem. It is quite easy. Okay.